Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Babysitting the chickens. Nice. So you're the off-grid creationist. Yes, and this is uh, a good way to wake up in the morning and have some nice time in the outdoors and keeps the chickens quiet because they like me to sit out here with them. So they don't wake up the neighbors. <laughs> well, guys, for today's show, I'm hanging out here uh, on an extinct volcano with Lucky. Well, it is a beautiful day in Arizona. We just got finished with a rim and raft trip. You've been doing these for how long? Oh, uh, 18, 19 years now. Wow. Yeah. So you've gotten to see the Grand Canyon from every perspective you can imagine. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I think <laughs> I, I've awesome. rafted the entire length 12 or 13 times. Wow. You know that the last section, which is generally considered a four-day trip, I've done that probably about 20 to 24 huh. times. And then, of course, the part that we raft, uh, you know, like we did yesterday morning, oh, I have no idea, 70 times maybe. Wow. Yeah. yeah. A couple of so, Anyways, yeah, there was one year I spent 95 nights in Grand Canyon. That was that was way too much, I'll be honest with you. Wow, 95 nights. So Joanna's coming out, so now, now the girls are starting to make All those chickens answer. are ready to, ready to eat, huh? Yeah. This isn't really a normal event, come out here and sitting out here by the greenhouses and the chickens. But it keeps them quiet. It's not Florida on the beach, but it's for Arizona. Oh. It's about as good as it gets. This is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. It is peaceful. It's this is a feels like an oasis away from the busyness and the craziness of the world. And going up to Grand Canyon, enjoying the trip, enjoying the tour, but lots of people yeah. being around, lots of people coming here, and just kind of feeling like you're secluded uh, is is a pretty neat it's a bluff this time yesterday morning we were just starting to to head down to the rafts yeah and we were rafting down the colorado river yesterday with with 52 other people and uh by five o'clock in the afternoon we were sitting here watching watching the deer and the elk that's right so that's a that's a pretty cool feeling that's good to us yeah well russ it seems like you've had you know two really successful careers from the from the world of, from the world's perspective of doing uh, head hunting, so to speak, and, and mm -hmm. having a very successful business, and then literally giving that away because you saw a need and doing ministry and having an incredibly successful ministry where now you're one of the premier speakers on creation and your talks are, um, they're riveting, they're funny, they're engaging, and they are right on target, right on point, uh, kind of a no, don't hold back. Tell me real quick about the, the, the journey that you've been on in, uh, maybe an overview of career one. And then, uh, where you've been here with career two for the last, how long has it been? 20, almost 20 years, 22 now, 22 years. Well, um, I was raised in a Christian home story, not greatly unlike yours. I met Joanna, my wife. She was very active in, in her church, and she actually got me going back to church. Oh, nice. And Not like a girl to do that, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and really had a big influence. I started going to church, and I started realizing this is really important, and I felt God starting to call me back. And, you know, some people can say I was saved on this day right here at this second. No, my, my, I would say I never, I mean, I would have always told you I was a Christian, but I don't think I really knew what a Christian was when I was younger. And uh, finally, when I was about 32, uh, we got rebaptized and uh, really began my walk at that point in time. Wow. By the age of 40, I'd become a trustee in my church. And it was actually at that time when uh, Joanna got me to watch a video from a creation speaker that you know pretty well. <laughs> and... God just used that. I I saw several lies right out of textbooks that I've been taught when I was in college. And God just used that to light a fire under me. Wow. And I studied this intently for about four years. All my spare time, I was reading. I read 
Out of my 174 college credits, I've probably read 24, 25 books. I've probably read 80 books on this subject. Wow. And I probably watched 40 sets of uh, videos uh, from other creationists. And after about four years, in the last year or so I was in business, most of my day I was working on this these presentations. You're and learning and learning to present, yeah. One evening, I was going to actually watch a video, and it was like God taps me on the shoulder and says, Rush, you know this as well as anybody. Here's what I want you to do. Next day, I went to Joanna. I said, you know, I don't... And at that point in time, I was going to retire in a few more years, sell my business, retire. And my plan was to spend the rest of my life, you know, working out in the morning, playing golf a couple, three times a week, <laughs> hunting Cape Buffalo in Zimbabwe. You know, the important things The, the good stuff in life, yeah. And... I just went to Joanna. I said, I don't think God wants me making, spending my life making money and goofing off. I think he wants me to get this information to people and make a difference in their lives. And, wow. and Joanna, so I blame it on her, by the way. <laughs> she says, if that's what you feel God wants us to do, that's what we need to do. So I completely blame it on her. <laughs> and, oh, uh, you know, we prayed about it. And about a couple of weeks later, we told one guy who worked for me for 13 years, hey, I'm leaving. I'm going into a ministry. He wasn't in a position he could afford to buy the business. So I just said, you can have the business. And I walked away from it. 20 we went years cold business. turkey. We went cold turkey into the ministry. Wow. And I must admit, I thought, wow. Because at that time, we were losing 80 85 percent of our kids by the age of 20 that's closing in on 90 percent now yeah um but i figured and i thought that once pastors saw our messages and the impact it had on people in the church we'd be so busy and i gotta tell you we we start getting door slammed in our face left and right and it took me a couple years to figure out the age of the earth is is the key issue here and with over 90 percent of our seminaries and colleges teaching older beliefs so many churches, the pastors have accepted it, or they don't want to stand up and make, you know, they don't want to upset someone who's accepted it. So now we've got theistic evolution, Jesus's, and progressive grace, and Jesus's, and gap theory, Jesus's, and day age theory, Jesus's. And I'm like, hey, does anyone believe in the Jesus of the Bible who <laughs> says he created in six days, rested on the seventh, and judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven? Because we could go on for hours about this, but. Uh, you know, it's foretold in Second Peter 3 that last days scoffers will claim uniform processes and deny the flood. Yeah. And my friends, if you're listening and you've been fooled by one of these old earth yeah. beliefs, understand those beliefs, even in Christian circles, are based on a belief in uniform processes and no global flood. You're agreeing with the secular worldview. You know, from our standpoint, we don't seem to understand why it matters. Hey, if God used six days or six billion years or whatever, why does it matter? You hear that all the time. Well, first of all, besides giving the secular atheist side their foundation, which is millions of years of time, people think it's Darwinism. No, no, Darwinism is a fruit coming off the old earth tree. Darwin couldn't have developed his ideas if the old earth worldview hadn't come about right before that. Exactly. So actually, it's the millions of years of belief for their foundation. The evil fruit includes Darwinism, and those two have combined as a juggernaut. But going back to the flood issue, the flood's the whole linchpin in the world worldviews. Mm -hmm. This is why the other side gets so mad. They'll get mad if you talk about Darwinism, but you need bodyguards if you want to talk about the age of the earth. Wow. And unfortunately, that's almost true inside the church as well today. So people have been fooled into taking these beliefs. And one reason is that they don't understand why it matters. Why does it matter if God used... Six days, 6,000 years, 6 billion years, who cares? Well, the issue is uh, the foundation of the gospel message. The foundation of the gospel message, I call it the cost, C-O-S and the cross, uh, is that, you know, people today have trouble answering the simple question, how can we have a loving God and we'll roll for the death and suffering? That's the biggest argument against Christianity in the world today. It is, yeah. and the answer is so simple, it's it blows people over, and this is... I start out almost all my messages in the church by explaining the cost, and people's mouths just drop open. Even pastors come up to me and say, I never gave that a second mm -hmm. thought. And, and the simple, the cost is this. It's the foundation of the gospel message, and it's found in Genesis 1 and 3. And this is where we're told, and here's the answer to how can you have a loving God and a world full of death and suffering. 
The answer is simple. It's that God didn't give us the world the way it is today full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. That's the C in cost, creation. Well, what happened to it? Oh, well, Adam's O, original sin. Now, that's not the original sin. That was Lucifer. But it was Adam's original sin that brought death into the world. And that's why we live in a world full of death. You have a loving creator. That's the biblical answer. And it's so simple. God gave us a perfect creation. Adam's original sin allowed death, brought on the curse, allowing death to enter. And that's why we live in a world full of death but have a loving creator. But the answer should go further than that, Eric. That original sin that brought in death, this is the essence cost, separated mm. us from God. Now this required us, and this is the T of the cross, to be redeemed. But as you know, we can't redeem ourselves with God. You do a great job of explaining how we're all... And getting people to realize, hey, have you ever told a lie? And, yeah. I mean, you, you, I've seen you do it a million times. I do that. I, I usually use that same. Use the law to bring about the knowledge of sin, yeah. like the Bible says. Yeah. So, how loving is God? So despite our sin that corrupted the creation, allowing death to enter, He sent His only begotten Son to suffer and die on that cross, the, the mm. cross and the, and the cost. So, creation, original sin, separation, and the cross. That's the mm. cost. That's what my book, Cost, is based on. Um, but that's how you answer that question and lead people right to the gospel message. And here's the issue. Most Christians today can't answer that simple question, how can we have a loving God and a world full of death? Why? Well, see, the answer has been lost. With over 90% of Christian colleges and seminaries teaching old earth beliefs. So follow me on this. You're probably still thinking, oh, what's the age you have to do with it? Mm. All old earth beliefs put death... Let's say here's when Adam's made. Now, Jesus said, in the beginning, God made man, male and female. The first five words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. Jesus says man was made in the beginning. But all old earth beliefs put death before, before Adam. Adam. You can't believe millions of years of death existed before man, and then turn around and tell people it was man's sin that brought in death, separated us from God, requiring our redemption. That's mm. what the age of the earth is all about. Satan is really good at what he does. And I've got to tell you, I have pastors all the time that hear this come up to me and say, Russ, I never even thought about what death before Adam, what it does. And the reason for that is our colleges and seminaries aren't standing on the truth. They're compromising uh, with the secular foundation. And when we do that, we have lost the battle from the start. Wow. And it's not popular. It's not popular to take on the age of the earth issues. But if mm -hmm. you just saw that, how simple that is to overcome them. So now we get in. Now you need to get into the science. Where does the old earth? How do the old earth beliefs? Where do they come from? How are they derived? And if you follow it, and you've seen it, like our my top ten uh, old earth beliefs expose it, it's quick to the point message, and it always comes back to whether there was a global flood. Right. People say, "Oh no, the radiometric dating techniques." Well, they have to get a date that matches that man-made geologic column. And what's the geologic column based on? A belief that the Stratified layers that make up the crust of the earth formed slowly and uniformly, yep. not quickly in a global flood. They're denying, they're claiming uniform processes and denying the global flood. Exactly. Just like Second Peter says. 3, 3 through 6, told us they would wow. in the last days. The, it, the Bible is true, word for word and cover to cover. And when we compromise God's word to fit with what secular atheists believe, that, that's our mistake, wow. not God's mistake. So my message is to show people that they can put their trust in God's word, word for word and cover to cover, because it was the word who created us. It was the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is our creator. He's our judge who says he judged man's sin already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. So when we deny him as creator and deny him as judge, we're walking in a dangerous path, wow. a very dangerous path. So what I, I tell, and I used to be a theistic evolutionist. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not attacking you if you believe in any of those non-biblical beliefs. Did I just step on your toes? <laughs> I didn't do it to be mean, my friends. Look, if you're a theistic evolutionist, a progressive creationist, a gap theorist, a day theorist, try to find that belief in the Bible, okay? Mm. And you won't do it. If you're honest and you really look at it, you'll, you're accepting people's beliefs in uniform processes and no global flood, just like the Bible said. And if that's just changed your life, 
get some information from Eric, get some information from me. We've got the information that'll help you out. And just like someone helped me, I used to be a theistic evolutionist. I'm not attacking you. I'm, I'm here to help you. You know, it is interesting, the number of people that have seen your tapes and will write to you, email you, text you, and you'll get it when you get out of this volcano and go, that changed. It's amazing how this information and the right perspective on the Bible will change your life, will make you realize, I really can trust God's word from cover to cover. And when you really get there, you stop leaning on your own understanding. You yes. stop trying to go, well, let me figure out, you know, who's right in psychology, who's right in science, who's right in all these different fields. Yes. And you realize God's word is true. I really can trust it for my marriage, for my finances, for uh, my other relationships for, right. for my, the way the way man thinks, you know, the, That's right. we, we are not good people uh, that sometimes do bad things. We are born sinners that are, are, have a tendency of a we are born with that bent. And absolutely. everything changes when you realize I can trust God's word. Yep, absolutely. It, it changes everything when you realize I don't have to figure out which parts of the Bible are true and which parts I need mm. to actually accept sectoral atheist beliefs on. When you realize the secular atheist got it wrong. Yeah. And also the other thing I'd point out is people think that science is against the Bible. No, no, no. Not at all. Not a bit. Real science is a believer's best friend. Always has been. Mm. Always will be. Most people today don't realize that uh, most people today think virtually no branches of science were started by Christians. Actually, 82 percent wow of the branches of science were started by christians now i've never looked up that other 18 percent. i'd like to see how many were started uh by atheists by, well by jews oh because you, <laughs> they you, still had a if one you, god world if you throw this in with the christian the total is probably going to be in the 90 percent now range. about how many branches of science can we can we distinguish because we think of the basics biology chemistry mm -hmm. you know but then you got zoology anthropology you know you got all the how about how many are you thinking? there's about 200 Wow. There's about 200. Wow. And over 80% started by Christians. I, we need to, to look into how many of those started by, by uh, the Jewish. And how many, that's going to leave very few that were started by people that don't have any kind of biblical, some sort of a biblical foundation, which is lucky. Lucky. Hey, Nagadoc. She's over there alone. terrorizing the chickens. She loves to run at them and just she, watch them run. Yeah, stop that. You just like to watch them run, don't you? Um, you know, and Eric, I think folks listening should understand the difference between real science, a believer's best friend, which is operational science. Right. They need You need to understand the difference between operational science and historical science. And once you understand that, then you'll understand how you're being misled and lied to by what you think is science. Operational science is knowledge derived from the study and observation of testable, repeatable evidences. And that is a believer's best friend. Mm. Where there's controversy between what the Bible says and science is not with operational science, real science. No, no, it's with historical science. <laughs> historical science is not knowledge derived from the study of evidence. That's operational science. Historical science is our assumptions based on taking operational science, findings that you can test, study, and observe today, rates you can test, study, and observe today, and try to Try to impose those rates of today based on belief in uniformity, yep. just like the Bible told us, and try to impose those on a non-observe events from the past. So they look at strata formation today, which is, let's say, one inch per thousand years, and they try to say it's always been the same rate, uniformity, and that's where they come up with the, the geologic column and their <laughs> millions of years of beliefs. They have to deny the global flood. Like Second yep. Peter said, uniform processes denying the flood, and that's historical science. That's not operational science. Um, what's have you ever seen one car rear end another car? Rear ends a car, boom! In a millionth of a second, the hoods crumple. Let's say you'd never seen that before, and you believed in uniform processes, and no, <laughs> no catastrophic processes. Well, you could come along, you see the crumpled hood, you could measure it for virtually nothing at all today. And based on uniformity, you, you might think it took hundreds of millions of years to crumple that hood. And you'll be 100% off base. 
happen quickly, not slowly, at today's observed rates. That's historical science. Taking operational science you can observe today and try to apply those processes to the past based on a belief in uniformity and no global flood, just like the Bible said would happen. You know, and that's why when creationists make a big deal out of Mount St. Helens, we're looking at, we're saying, look, here is a modern day evidence of, of that car rear-ending another car and showing us how quickly that can happen, how fast the strata layers can form at Mount St. Helens with with strata that is is there and was not there literally 40 years ago and in a couple of hours was formed. Yeah. And absolutely. so we're, we're looking at these things, science, man's best friend, a believer's best friend, going, this is what helps us explain mm -hmm. all the layers that we see today. It had to be a catastrophe. Yeah. It couldn't have been something that happened slowly. And then the evidence of if it did happen slowly. You know, we're there at the Grand Canyon and we point out there's no erosion in between these layers. There's, you know, if, if this happens slowly, you would have erosional features in between a layer and the next layer would fill that in and you would see these spots where erosion had taken place. And, right. and we don't see that anywhere. Nice it's all horizontal contact yeah. points, clean contact points. Um, that's only, uh, that's only ex explicable by layers laid down quickly. In fact, why are there different layers? Why do you have all sandstone, all... Yeah. limestone all mudstone why are why are they separated well if you've ever seen a miner with a pan he scoops up some sediments and water he sloshes it back and forth and the moving water in his pan separates those sediments in his pan by grain size weight and density the goal uh, being the make sure you hit that again so yeah grain size weight the weight of it so that the 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 the, the um What's the word for, I guess, density really is it, isn't yeah. it? The density of the particles. And, and yeah, the grain size, weight, and density. And, well, the goal being the densest falls to the bottom right. of the pan. Well, on a global scale, the fountains of the deep erupted. The, the Earth's surface is crisscrossed with about 50,000 miles of fault lines. Most of those are probably scars left over from when the fountains of the deep erupted. And the continents later shifted apart uh, from those, like right. you have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge running right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But why do we have the stratified layers making up the crust of the earth? I mean, if they form slowly over long ages of time, I think it'd primarily just be one big brown conglomerate. But they're, they're stratified because the fountains of the deep erupted, eroded probably a top mile to two miles of the earth's original surface. And now in the first 150 days of the flood, those sediments are rolling around and the water is separating them by grain size, weight, and density. Over the second 150 day period, as the water start to abate, they start laying those sediments back down. Same sediments that were there before, but now they're separated by grain size, weight, and density, and they're getting laid down all sandstone, all limestone, all mudstone, etc. And that's why we have the stratified layers that make up the crust of the earth. So if you had a world covered with water and no land masses stopping the tides that we have today, and over, you know, literally hundreds of days, you are having water being able to go around the world mm -hmm. with no continents stopping. You would, you would, you'd be picking up huge amounts of sediments, laying them down. You'd be sorting through that whole thing, multiple, multiple, twice a day. You've got the tides sorting out these yeah. particles for hundreds of days. Yeah, you had a lot going on wow. during that flood. It was beyond human comprehension. The continents were, were starting to separate along with the fissures. The fountains deep had erupted. I think they probably, through the latter part of the flood, slid apart uh, more rapidly and violently. And leading to what we have continental drift today, based on uniformity. Yeah. <laughs> and by observing the rate continents move today, which is maybe a half inch a year. We don't know. They might just be rocking back and forth now. <laughs> but based on a half inch year, they're thousands of miles apart. Based on uniformity and believe there is never a global flood, which would have caused this to happen quickly. They say it took hundreds of millions of years to, for the continents to separate. Again, just like Second Peter 3 told us, based on uniformity and the belief there was never a global flood. Wow. Things happen quickly. How long did it take that hood to crumple, by the way? So a global flood destroys the geologic column. Exactly. It destroys continental drift. What other kind of things does a global flood destroy? You're, you, you would claim a, a global flood destroys... Every old earth belief out there. Yeah, the radiometric dating techniques have to get a date that matches the geologic column. So since 
the flood explains how the layers form quickly, uh, not over long ages of time. It also destroys radiometric dating techniques and their, at least their assumptions, their, right. their, their conclusions, which are really assumptions, not conclusions. Because when they date things and we know how old it is, it doesn't seem to work. Exactly. They've dated rock at Mount St. Helens, right? That was just a couple of years old. Millions, <clears throat> millions, hundreds of millions of years. Old. Right. You see that all the time, by the way. Uh, potassium argon dating has been their number one radiometric dating technique for the last 50 years. And now they're starting to realize there's oftentimes they're, me they're me uh, measuring the amount of uh, argon in a rock. Say it took this long to form. Potassium 40 decays in argon 40. Let's not get into the little details here. <laughs> but they're measuring the amount of argon and they're saying, well, it took this long to form. But they're starting to find that argon is often in the rock when it first forms. Wow. So the rock can date millions of hundreds of millions of years older than it is so they because they're assuming there's zero argon in it when yes. it forms but and they, now they're discovering there's argon in it when it forms so they've been using potassium argon <laughs> dating and a lot of guys and women inside the church that have accepted old earth beliefs that put death before adam were accepting the potassium argon dating method saying that was science when it's not science let's talk about science falsely so called yeah and yes i understand that word science could mean knowledge let's not get off into a rabbit trail on that <laughs> Watch out for false knowledge, including false knowledge masquerading as science. Um, but yeah, a global flood explains uh, the stratified layers, which is the whole key. Uh, explains continental drift. Explains the ice age. Ice age, not ice ages. Uh, the warm fountains warmed up the oceans. The est estimate, estimates seem to indicate that the average flood water around the globe was anywhere from 90 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, man, that's a warm... There were was, there was some areas where it was probably 500 degrees. There were some areas where it was probably 30 degrees. But on average, it was about 100 to 120 degrees when you have Fahrenheit. Because when you have the fountains of the deep breaking up, when you have the continents spreading apart, you've got molten earth mantle coming up, creating new ocean floor. Right. And that's going to be boiling water yes. right there in some yeah. spots. You had all kinds of catastrophe, mm. catastrophes going on during that flood. And, um, oh, and uh, um, this is just fascinating to me. They are discovering that there is water in liquid form that cannot turn to steam that is way above the 212 degrees, mm -hmm. but it's under so much pressure, it cannot turn to steam mm -hmm. way down there. And that creates uh, the, the wormwood or the ringwood or something yes. like that down yes. there. And so it's, anyway, that's a whole other fascinating subject. Yeah. Of, yeah, there's uh, lots of water, though. Yeah. Lots of water. <laughs> Um, so I always, always have people, that's another subject here. Yeah. Where did all water go? Well, we can talk about that in a minute, but what about the ice age? Well, the, the warm oceans during the flood led to the ice, the one and only ice age, which was actually a very warm tropical climate, by the way. And so it led to massive evaporation. When the clouds moved over the poles, they pounded snow onto the poles and it was raining over the, the, the equators and the lower uh, latitudes. And this is what led to the one and only ice age. So the ice age was a direct result of the global flood and, and probably lasted for 500 to 800 years after the flood. But as the ocean slowly cooled, remember this is a very warm tropical climate. The ice age was a very warm tropical climate with lots of moisture. Um, as the ocean slowly cooled, the, eva the, the evaporation became less and less and eventually the ice age ended. The ice caps in the lower latitudes melted back quickly, filling in the oceans. This is why we have different looking people groups. There's so much this explains. Not different races. One race, mm. all made in the image of God. Different looking people groups because we were separated. You want to go into that whole thing? I think it's fascinating. Okay. I, mean, I don't think, I think a lot of people misunderstand, you know, races and, and let alone if we were to get into what has been done in the name of evolution. Mm because of the different people groups. I yes. mean, some unbelievable atrocities have been done oh. trying to, anyway, that, but yes. but this makes sense of it. The Ice Age and then cutting off land bridges, uh, isolating people groups, it makes sense of why people look different in different geological or different uh, yeah, geographies. Different yeah, let, let's explain that. It's yeah. well worth explaining. It's one of my favorite questions to answer is why do we have different races? We don't have different races. We have one race, <laughs> the human race. And that... Different races, that's really more of an evolutionary belief. Mm. Uh, Darwin's book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. If you wow. think you're the most evolved, you're the favored race, 
uh, the Nazis used that. I don't know. We can go. It's being used, used today. It. Yes. It's being used today yes. to help fuel racism, even here in America. Absolutely. If you're being taught in school that you're nothing but an animal and you're looking around at the different skin groups, yeah. there are people today that are, you know, racism used to be, oh, only against here in America, only against black people. No, there is reverse racism. There, there is racism of all sorts, all based on an evolution of worldview, not based on, and there's, there's Christians that don't understand the truth of uh, the, the creation worldview Absolutely. and evolution didn't take place and have adopted the idea of some Absolutely. form of racism. Why are there Christians that do that? Because they've accepted old earth beliefs. It's always old earth beliefs. They're evil. And let Eric and I show you how there's no reason to believe in them scientifically. That God's word, the global flood trumps every old earth belief. Yeah. But going back to the races, so after the global flood and the ice caps had formed as a direct result of the flood, and for, again, five to 800 years afterwards, we're in the one and only ice age, people gathered at Babel and they refused to spread out around the globe. Now, before the ice caps, before the ice age ended and the ice caps melted and filled in the oceans, you had land bridges, continental shelves, you could, now you could, you could walk all the way around the globe. Animals had already quickly spread out after the global flood and they got off the ark, but people refused to spread out and they gathered at Babel. So it was about 200, 250 years after the flood, God confused languages at Babel and forced people to spread out around the globe. Well, so again, you could, you could travel around the globe because of the ocean waters. Even secular textbooks teach us it used to be about 400 feet lower than they are today. So there were land bridges or continental shelves, etc., and people spread out around the globe. And as the oceans cooled and the evaporation became less and less, the ice caps in the lower latitudes started to melt back. The ice caps used to come down to Kansas City, Missouri. They're about yeah. 2,000 miles north of there today. So, oh, by the way, don't destroy the U.S. economy because the ice caps are melting. They've been melting back for over 4,000 years, my friends. <laughs> Nothing new about the ice caps melting. But they filled in the oceans, and now people were separated by languages, nations, and islands and continents. So they had to marry within those gene pools captured on their island or continent, and slight adaptational, uh, you can call them variations, adaptations, microevolution. Even I would, I would use the word epigenetics now because we're learning so much about how a, a, an environment will affect your your genetics and so yes. switches will be turned on or off based exactly. on your environment and that exactly that i think led to huge so aspects that, of that that led to different looking people groups not different races different looking mm -hmm. people groups and that's why you know a species even a different species can be the same kind but a general definition of a species is it can't breed with their parent form so they become a new species we don't have different species of humans. Exactly. We just have one species. All the people one groups race, can, can yeah. and breed. <laughs> so we don't even have different species of humans. We just have one, one species. The human race is one race. We have different looking people groups. Now that is it. just that thought. I've never. Why didn't they apply races to the to the animal groups? Why didn't they apply those to the you know the wolves in uh, in, in different parts of the world or to the or to the different dog kinds, you know, exactly. why, why don't they use species there and not... Yeah. Why, why don't they use species with humans? Because right. that would show we're all one species. Yeah. <laughs> we're one race, the human race, all made in the image of God, just like the Word of God says. You can't that's, bring division when you, when you do that. That's the biblical worldview, is we're all one race, one species, all made in the image of God. And that's, that's our dog harassing right. the chickens over here, by the way. Lucky. It's Lucky. your favorite Come thing. Where you might sit and watch a football game or a movie, she likes to she, sit and do this with her chickens. <laughs> so the, the biggest difference in people groups today is the color of our skin. Uh, this has been beaten to death, but it's this amount of melanin you have in your skin. That is that is such a tiny fraction of a percent yes. in the overall yes. differences of people. It's I mean, not, it's not even, not even a percent difference. Not even it, a it's, a, it's, a to, it's like a yellow flower and a red flower yes. that are the same exact kind and species yes and i'm melanin challenged now it's <laughs> just too. like i'm i'm follically challenged you're follically non-challenged 
Now, my my perception is you have too many female genes in your gene pool, whereas real men lose their hair. But that's that's a whole different argument, okay? All right. Um, we have to do some scientific studies on that. <laughs> so, but back to, to people groups. It's just a matter of how much melanin we have. That's the big difference. And it's really just a matter of skin color. But this is why we can do blood transfusions between different looking people groups all over the globe. We can do kidney transplants, etc. It's because we didn't evolve to different levels. We didn't evolve into different species of humans. We're all one species, one race, that's the human race. And the biblical view is we're all made in the image of God, just like the Word of God says. I love it. That is another great thought. Why didn't we separate ourselves based on blood types? Why didn't we decide, oh, you're the, you know, you're the O species yes. or O race and, and you're the A positive race yes. and that way we can identify with something that we could actually, you know, use. Yeah, <laughs> or, or separate by, by mature men who don't have hair on their head and, and immature men with too many female genes in their gene pool that still have hair on their head. But I'm more intelligence, fine. you know, the more intelligent and the less intelligent. I mean, there's a lot of ways we can... We could, <laughs> we could do this. Okay, I deserve that. Um, and there's actually a lot of truth to that anyways. <laughs> anyways, uh, oh, Eric, okay. I, I, I just appreciate what you do, and I appreciate your friendship, and I, I, I love doing trips with you down the, down the, the Colorado River. I just River love it that you're and... educating the world. And um, all right, we'll go eat breakfast. We'll just we'll let you guys join us for the for the next little while for the morning before I got to head to the airport. and. And see what we do around the uh, around the farm here, and maybe talk a little bit more because I, I, we got to tell them about your new your new course. Okay, let's do that up on the top yeah. of the canyon. Oh, that's a crater. Idea. We'll go up on top it. of the crater. Yeah, get the jeep out and get it going. Heavenly Father, thanks for letting us just hang out in your beautiful creation. Lord, we look forward to the new heaven and the new earth. Mm -hmm. I'm just excited, God, whatever you have for me. Thank you for Russ. Thank you for Joanna. Thank you for their dedication through the uh, ups and the downs of ministry and their willingness to just educate the world to, to know who you are and why your word and why this creation is so important. Thanks for this tree, Lord. Bless it to our bodies. May our bodies be used for your glory and yours alone today, your precious. Amen. Joanna, you've outdone yourself. Wow. Well, breakfast was fantastic, Russ. What's next? Well, we need to go up on top of the crater and uh, let you see the, the the world from above. Get a good view. Yeah, get a good view. Let's do it. Talk a little bit up there. Sounds good. Let's go, guys. Okay, you ready? Here we go, baby. We don't have many, but there are rattlesnakes up here. And they love these rocky areas. So I'm just kind of looking around before we go stepping out there. So that's our house. You can see our, our uh, solar panels our house is hidden in the oak trees right there um, but you get a good view you can actually see the crater from up here you can see the whole area around and uh, that's the old lake bed they've they diverted the water from the lake about 20 years ago this is one of only two natural lakes in Arizona and they actually diverted the water from it if you can believe they got away with that you can see where the lake bed was. It's now just a big meadow. There are ponds. If you went out a walk, tried to walk across here, you'd find there's more water than it looks like. But uh, that's where the elk and the deer spend most of the nights out there. Uh, even this morning when I got up, they left out about 5.30, but there were about 50 to 60 elk out there. And uh, this morning, sometimes we have two to three times that many. And you, know, you can see the water held back by this berm. And that's Every year we have uh, resident geese that come in in January and nest and raise their young there. Um, you saw some of those this morning. They'll be flying off here in another two to three weeks. And 
they'll be gone again until next January. They'll come back and it's the same. The young ones come back and they then they they're the ones that are nesting there. So yeah, it's a great place to live. We feel we feel blessed to be out here. We enjoy it. You know, I'm a super conservative, yet I live in an off-grid cabin and I drive a Prius. I mean, <laughs> so so no liberal can get on to me. I'll you turn the I'll turn the tables on them in a hurry. Yeah. You know both worlds pretty well. Yeah. Pretty well settled there. So we're over here on top of the crater and man, it just it let loose outside. Well, it's been a good uh, With this guy right here, the off-grid creations. <sighs> Unbelievable. Pretty cool. But we're having a great microwave conversation. Hopefully this is still up here. Oh, I think we're good. Thank you, little shelter. <laughs> That's what protected us. It's time to head back. Look, oh, look at this. Unbelievable. Look how much water we got. That's that's three quarters of an inch of rain right there. Wow. Unbelievable. Oh no. Can you see the water in the <laughs> bottom? Oh great. So now we're heading back down the hill. Oh yeah. Riding in style with the off-grid creations. Well guys, we ran into a little uh rainstorm and it's time for me to head to the airport already. Can you believe it, Russ? Unbelievable. Yeah. It's gonna be a trip though. Yeah, definitely uh, fun getting caught up there, living with the off-grid creationists for a day. Absolutely. Pretty, pretty cool, man. Well, you're dodging the bullet here because I was huh? going to have you chopping wood all afternoon. and Right there? Then it rained. You, you, you got some yesterday, but I thought you were just getting warmed up. This guy is a, a wood chopping machine right here, and uh, I have to cut up and collect four and a, about 4.3 cords of wood, which is a lot of wood, by the That's way. That's a good amount of wood right there. Because um, the cord is four foot wide, four foot tall, eight feet long. And I need 4.3 cords that'll fill this woodshed up. We're almost there, but got about another cord to go. And I was Man. really planning on putting you to work today, Man. but that rainstorm just. Yeah, I, I, thank got you. Get, you see, that's God's it. blessing. Man. God's blessing on my life. I gotta appreciate tell that, you. Lord. I think so. Got Thanks caught so. in the rain and didn't have to do the chores with you. Anyways. I uh, love it. Anyhow, it's okay. We'll, we'll get it <laughs> done eventually. Sounds good. It's actually cleared up. Sweet. So we've talked about the creation, why it's important. We've talked about the flood and how the flood destroys every old earth belief. How a biblical worldview solves all the cultural problems that we face today. Just need to get back to the authority of scripture. Um, what is it? What is it that we want people to do? Like when somebody says, okay, I believe it, now what? Okay, yes, I'm, I'm using this in my life to try to make a difference in my family, to be the husband or wife I need to be. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be the child that I should be that honors my parents because I know God's word is true. Um, but we looked at the latest Barna polls and just came out that, wow. One, two, three. The thing with those guys, they're going over a hammer and we've got a plumber there. Yes, we do. Is <laughs> um, that you switch lanes, you look and it's clear and you sway and all of a sudden these guys are so fast. Look at that. that hey. uh, I don't know. Oh. You try to watch out for them, but it'd be really easy to switch, look and not see them and switch lanes. They're coming up so fast. but. Anyways, I guess I guess there really is natural selection. <laughs> <Not just that. laughs> oh man, the Darwin Awards, I love those. So we've gone through this, and when it comes down to okay, well, what's the next practical thing? I think it's it's kind of like when, when Jesus said, "Go into all the world and disciple them to teach them." We need people getting what you've already done. You don't copyright your videos on purpose just so that people can teach others with this material. Exactly. You know, Eric, you don't copyright your material either because our heart is to get this information to people. The easiest way to do that, let's just use, because certainly yours work the same, 
My top 10 Darwinian lies in the textbooks. Why everybody under the age of 75 has not seen that, especially youth and college kids. It's heartbreaking to me because one person can take it, make, make, give copies, send them email on Facebook, and whatever it takes. Just get it out there. Get it out there, and it would make a huge impact. It's had biology teachers quit their job and become Christians. So kids would see, it would just be life changing to so many kids. And it breaks my heart. Whoa. Wow. Passing us between two vehicles. Wow. That was impressive. I got to tell you. I assume it hurt them, but if they hit her Prius, actually, it might take yeah. us out, you know? <laughs> you never know. Anyways, uh, it's heartbreaking. I wish people would just uh, get this out there. You know, I've had people in the past, I, I used to let people get my actual PowerPoint presentations and a DVD of my teaching, and if they just go through it five or six times, they can actually go out and parrot me and present that information. I've had pastors get the information and do that, and others, very knowledgeable Christians. And the feedback is always the same. The problem is they can't answer questions. It takes years to get to where you can answer questions. The easiest way to do it is just simply play these. The DVDs are my life teachings. They're about 45 minutes to sing to the point. Yeah. And my message is try a circle and tie, tie the knot on what I'm doing. I'm covering in that particular message. That's the best way to make an impact. My book, Cost, has a study guide at the end of each chapter. Um, it's what the public school course is based upon. And it's written in a, in a way that's easy to understand uh, to the point. And the way, I, the way I do things is I'll take a scientific paper that's 15 pages long and painstakingly force myself to read through it. It hurts. It hurts. <laughs> Sometimes those do. I admit it hurts, but I'll, I'll take a yellow marker and I'll make highlights in yellow as I read through it the first time. Then I will take a light pink marker and I'll only read the yellow highlights. Well, the 15 page paper is now about two pages of yellow highlights. I read the yellow highlights, highlighting the highlights of the yellow in pink. That brings that two pages down to about three quarters of a page. Then I go through with a light blue marker and only read the pinks. I highlight the highlight of the pinks in light blue. And that brings the information down to about a third of a page of information. And then I look at that and I say, oh, what are they saying? What? Now I'm starting to understand it more and more each time I read it. And I break it down into terms we all understand and make it easy to understand. My goal is to take that 15-page paper and be able to explain it where everyone can understand it with just one or two visuals in my mm. actual uh, teachings. And that actually is, is uh, can and, and is done. And that's my goal. So when I go through a 45-minute teaching with 120 visuals in that message, it might cover... It might cover several hundred pages of scientific papers. Just break it down where we can understand it. And so you've already done the work. Your presentations are phenomenal. Uh, I'm, I'm always blown away. i honestly kind of jealous of, of how well you do your presentations, all the humor and everything you bring into it. Um, I think something that has taken that because you've been a ministry to churches and to Christian schools, I think something that's taken that to the next level is your latest course that is now available as, and this blows my mind, your latest course on creation apologetics, including the gospel, mm -hmm. absolutely, is available for public school students. Absolutely. My whole, my, it's based on my book, Cost, which is basically the gospel message. Whoa, that guy was going about 100, and I guesstimate about 110 right there. Yeah, he was flying. Just so your the listeners will know, I'm actually going 75 in a 65 mile zone. Because if I go any slower, we would be totally <laughs> run over. There are people telling me right now because I'm only going 10 over the speed That's limit. So true. But uh, anyways, we um, the cost my book cost C O S and the cross. I was I was driving to a church in Arizona with my wife several years ago, and I said to my wife. You know, I, I need a simple acronym 
that will explain the gospel message and the foundations and something simple and easy to understand and explain. And it was this quick. It was like, bam, cost. I always have felt God just handed this to me. C-O-S and the cross. The C is creation. The O is original. The S is separation. And the T is actually the cross, cost. And that, that foundation is God gave us a perfect creation. It was corrupted by Adam's original sin that separated us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And I, I go into a little more detail about that, but it, it was also that original sin that brought death in the world. How do you, how do you answer the question, how can we have a loving God, a world full of death and suffering? If you've accepted an old earth belief, you can't biblically answer that question. Yeah. Because you've already accepted death before Adam. Because the biblical answer is God gave us a perfect creation. Adam's original sin brought in death, separating us from God, uh, requiring our redemption through Jesus. And that's what I teach in the class. And yes, that, that teaching, and I cover the top 10 old earth beliefs, the top 10 evil fruit of old earth beliefs, the top 10 uh, Darwinian teachings, because it's the first major fruit coming from old earth beliefs. It's a fruit coming from old earth beliefs. Old earth beliefs are the foundational issue. And I cover the top 10 reasons to believe in biblical creation and the global flood. And I end, begin all through and end with the gospel message. And that class is now available as a public school elective credit for high schoolers. Anyone can take the class private school, Christian school, home school, adults, anyone can take the class. But to get the uh, credit, it's, it's accredited to public high school students. That, that blows my mind, that you can be a public high school student. So what would happen if if we got every public high school student to take this course as one of their electives? Say, listen, here it is, it's an elective, it counts, and, uh, and started educating them on the reality that we are designed by God, there was original sin. That's why man's not good. It makes sense of so many things. We were separated from God. You go into the flood. You go into the judgment. You go into uh, racism. All these different issues are all covered. If people had that worldview, we'd have a different world. It would absolutely be, uh, it would change our culture. It would, instead of losing 90% of our kids, and they're, even the kids that, that have a decent foundation, there's so much peer pressure now. But if you got all the kids in public schools alone to see it, see this message or take this class, they would not have so much peer pressure on them. They would have a lot of allies on their side in the yeah. schools and friends and such. And I would say it would cut that, I can only take a wild guess, but it would probably cut that well below 50% instead of 90%. Some kids are still going to leave the faith because they make bad decisions, right? Um, That's what Romans says. Ultimately, they love sin more than they love their Savior is the problem, or who, the one who could be their Savior. So yes. That's ultimately yes. the problem. Sorry, I was kind of laughing as a truck went by about 90 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, man, i got to encourage you guys. Get a hold of this. Where can they get a hold of this course? The easiest way to get to it. You go to my website, creationministries.org, and in the left menu, it's creationministries.org. On the left menu, about the second item down, says high school course. Click on that, and it'll give you the link to the school's description of the course and also the link to the school's registration page. This is not my class. I helped the school put it together based on my book, but it is the school's class. And it's the school that has received exemplary accreditation status. It, it's the school's work that has gotten this to where it can qualify for a public high school credit. Wow. That's really cool. Well, there you go. You got the problem. You got the solution. Now you guys got to do is implement it, right? Absolutely. Let's get going if we don't implement it. That's right. <laughs> and the other thing, I mean, let's go back to copy DVDs. Get... My DVDs get Eric's. And also, we both have them on thumb drives, which makes it unbelievably easy to put it on your computer and send it to everybody in the world if you wanted to. Let's get this information out there and let's let's make a difference in people's eternal lives. Amen to that. Amen to that. But I appreciate you guys hanging out and uh, really just helping get disciple to know these truths and 
I pray that these truths would be something that help not only set you free, but that God uses you to do what the Great Commission tells us to do and teach other people. So let's go teach. Let's do what God has called us to do. I can't wait to see you guys next week. Thanks for partnering with us and for being part of the solution uh, to the problems we see around the world. And ultimately, that is the gospel. We love you guys. God bless. All right, one more crazy thought that is powerful before I go get on my flight. Russ, this was awesome. Repeat. Rewind. Play. Play. <clears throat> Erica, I was talking at a conference, and the conference, I was told, there were a wide variety of beliefs in the audience. So I, I came up to the podium, and, and God just handed this to me. I started out by saying, hey, I want to ask you guys a few questions. These are rhetorical. Please don't answer them out loud, but answer them to yourselves. First of all, let me ask, how many of you believe in a, in a version of Jesus who used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly evolve us and never judge the world with the flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven? That's a, that's a theistic evolution Christ. Or how many of you believe in a Christ who used millions of years to, of death and suffering to slowly create us and never judge the world with a global flood? That's a uh, progressive creation Christ. Or how many of you believe in a version of Christ who had a, a different creation that he destroyed because Satan and his minions had so badly corrupted it? Then he made the current creation, called it very good, and left it full of Satan and his minions. That's the gap theory Christ. Or how many of you believe in a Christ who created in six days, rested on the seventh, and judge man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. That is the biblical version of Christ. Now, now ask, let me ask you one more question. Um, how many Jesus has died on that cross? Because the only one found in the Bible said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through him. When he introduces himself, when he has the angel introduce him to the church of Laodicea, he has the angel introduce him as the creator. Hey, your, your creator's out here, and he's knocking on the door. I think this whole thing about making up different Jesuses, it's a much, much more serious issue than, than the church recognizes today. And remember, Jesus said many would seek, few would find I'm not attacking anybody. I used to be a theistic evolutionist myself. All I'm saying is look at the information Eric shares. Look at the information I share. We don't copyright our information. Get our videos uh, on thumb drives or DVDs. Watch them, learn from them, share them with others. And let's put our trust in the one and only Jesus found in the Bible, who is the one and only Jesus who suffered and died on that cross. His shed blood covering our sin, redeeming believers with him for eternity. Put your trust in the Word of God.